Welcome to an oral history of the church. I'm Jonathan McCormick. And I'm Adam Christman. An oral history of the church is a conversational church history podcast coming from a, a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history an art form. Let's get started. Well, Jonathan, as we gear up, this is the first episode of, as you are well aware, uh, dear listener, this is the first episode of a new volume, a new season for an oral history of the church. Volume one ran from April of 2016 through September of 2016. Volume one was a, an oral, an actual oral history project. It was an oral history of the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's campus relocation. Uh, that yeah. school of now, of course, has a new name, Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. But uh, that was our focus. Uh, we felt it was important to, to try to get that done at that time. It was, it was going to be too late if we took any longer. We interviewed staff and faculty and alumni and students and local ministers uh, near the near the campus that got sold. Yes, uh, I've learned a lot about the school that I've called home for the last near decade. Uh, if you missed that, dear listener, uh, you can pop back and listen to those as well. That's right. They're all sitting there waiting for you. Uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube or uh, a direct link, perhaps, that you saw on Twitter or Facebook, you can actually subscribe to this podcast through iTunes uh, and most other podcast apps that I have checked it through. Um, I myself use Podcast Addict, and it works just fine through there. Um, but we're, we're real proud of Volume 1. We feel that it's it was pretty neat to get a, a, a 17 snapshot series of what the seminary, what that seminary was like during that period of time. Agreed. It, it helped store our history so other people can listen to it and hear what happened from, from our perspective and let history be the judge in the future. That's right. Something that's uh, unique about that first volume is how very niche it is, uh, how, what a very narrow focus it had, both as a subject for us to study and, frankly, uh, as an appeal to potential listeners. Um we, we did a very particular study about something that was dear to our hearts, but um, we're about to do something completely different. Yes. Here in Volume 2, we are going to look at historiography. We're looking at how history is written. What do historians do to decide, this belongs in the history book, this doesn't? Yeah. Uh, Exactly. So uh, what gets left behind, what gets included? How do history books get written? The name of this volume is the question, what is history? Is history just all the stuff that happened in the past? Then why is there a, a, a book that we call, this is a history book, this is a history of the Roman Empire, or this is a history of the Revolutionary, the American Revolutionary War? Um, what do we call that a history book if it doesn't include everything that happened during that period? Why is it important that Julius Caesar was stabbed 23 times, but we don't know what he had bre for breakfast that morning? Right, exactly. Exactly. This volume will cover seven or more episodes as we walk through our study. Uh, we're going to look at schools of historiography, uh, different different ideas of how to do history, and we'll look at other pieces that come into how history gets written, uh, what counts as uh, data, how we read that information, whether it's a book or 
a physical resource or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so we're we're excited about this. It's it's a subject that interests both of us. We have each studied uh, historiography, but uh, as well, we thought it would be helpful as an early volume to give any long-term listener a sense of how we are doing what we do. Um, and of course, it'll help you understand what other historians do when you read their books or hear them speak on radio or on TV or whatever uh, documentary. Um, so there's all that. All right. Uh, just a quick uh, announcement, a quick tease of an announcement, actually. If you stick around till the end of the episode, you'll catch some news about uh, something that Jonathan and I are both pretty excited about. Uh, so don't uh, don't don't delete your episode too fast uh, when we get to the end. There, you wanna you wanna stick around long enough to hear what that is. Stick around through the credits. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so today's topic in the study of what is history is school an introduction to schools of thought as jonathan mentioned there are uh, multiple ways to come at doing history writing history thinking about history so uh this is this is what he meant by that is there are different veins in which to try to tackle the task of understanding and re uh presenting uh, in the modern era what has happened in the past so uh jonathan and i are going to talk about uh four of those today uh there are more yet to come uh next time but uh we'll talk about that a little more later um so jonathan um why don't, why don't you kick us off with the introduction of schools of thought well, before we completely get into the topic, I do want to give a, a bit of a shout out to some of our sources um, or something you could continue up and follow up and read with to, to learn more, more about if this interests you. Uh, David Bebbington wrote Patterns in History, mm -hmm. a Christian perspective on historical thought. Um, and if you're a little more new to history and that title seems a little more overwhelming. <laughs> uh, Nathan, Nathan Finn uh, wrote a stu history, a student's guide. Uh, it's part of the reclaiming the Christian intellectual tradition. It's a great series. And this volume is a very good little book. Uh, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Both authors are worth your time. If you haven't read from either of them, uh, Finn t seems to focus more on uh, something more accessible, more uh, 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 more broadly accessible. So if you're if you're interested but um, not real deep yet into um, how to do history or how to think about history, um, he will have more along those lines. But uh, David Bemington is a world-renowned historian. Um, similarly worth your time if you are if you're ready for something a little deeper a little more detailed on uh, more of the technical side so these four schools are more or less their schools of thought that mm -hmm. they would discuss uh, the first one we're going to take a look at is what's called the cyclical view of history uh, okay in recent thought, we have uh, a historian by the name of Toynbee, uh, and the cyclical thought is like it sounds. Uh, the idea is that events in history form a cycle. So it's history starts with one thing, it mm -hmm. progresses through, it hits a peak and then it comes back around to this starting point on the cycle. I mean, we've seen this in at the popular level. You can see this in all kinds of uh, speeches and even in television shows and movies where 
a character will say history repeats itself, right? Um, this has entered the public consciousness, this cyclical view of history. Um, and I, I think people have rightly noticed that in the, in the Jewish scriptures, so in the Old Testament, you see uh, a form of the cyclical view of history, um, most especially notable in uh, the book of Judges and the books of Kings and Chronicles. Um, it's it's a cycle of, uh, in in short, uh, usually um, a covenant between God and His people. Things are sort of at peace. The people rebel. Um, the the ruler, depending on which book you're looking at, either delivers them or is wicked and makes things worse. And uh, God brings judgment if in that case, and the cycle repeats. Exactly. Something worth noting at this point, um, these schools of thought you can use methodologically. So you can uh, say, I'm going to tell this history mm -hmm. cyclically, even if you think all of history doesn't fit this cycle. Maybe this sure. time frame you're looking at does. Sure, and that could be argued for the scriptures that I just talked about. It could be argued that they are simply written that way, as you said, methodologically, rather than philosophically that this is this is history. We have a cycle of rebellion and punishment and peace. On the other hand, and we'll see this with each of these schools that we're looking at, these schools can represent a coherent and concrete worldview. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking a bit of some of our Eastern religions. Mm -hmm. um, you can, if everything comes from the, the divine nature and everything's going back to the divine nature and everything's a piece of that, mm -hmm everything's going around in this cycle. So it's not, for some, it's methodological. For others, it's, this is how they see the whole meta-historical, meta-narrative working of history. Yeah. Uh, the next well, movement before, that... Before we move on, Jonathan, can you spell for our listeners uh, Toynbee, just so that if they want to follow up on somebody who's written about this more specifically, they can look that person up. Sure. I can spell that. Uh, it's Arnold J. Toynbee, T-O-Y-N-B-E-E. -E. Very good. So if any of you folks are interested in looking up someone who talks about the cyclical view more in depth, uh, there you go. You can look up that author and um, find his works that deal with it. Jonathan, go ahead and uh, why don't you move on to the next one as you were about to. <laughs> the, the next school of thought we're going to call historicism. Okay, historicism. I, I don't love this name for it, by the way. I don't think it's very... Um, <laughs> it's I don't not think it tells helpful. You, yeah, it's not helpful. It's like, here's the name name of a person. <laughs> My name is name. That doesn't help. <laughs> Or if your name is Person, uh, although I guess I'm one to talk since my name is Adam. Uh, <laughs> Historicism is the idea that the way we tell history shapes historical events. Mm -hmm. So the culture that produces the history is going to have certain interests and ways of seeing things and that's going to influence what ends up in the history books sure uh can you give us an example or two so an example we have is in in the americas our historians have tended to speak about um events in providential terms so if there's a a good harvest in the 
early colonies, mm -hmm. we talk about God's favor. Um, and if things didn't go well, they would talk in terms of God's judgment. Mm -hmm. And so if you're recording religious history and you're a religious people, you're going to include what you consider to be divine acts. And you're going to include pretty heavily your religious figures within your within your history. Um, if you're a militaristic culture, you're going to include your your great war heroes. That's right. That's right. So we, as we read these histories, we are often shaped by these heroes that we read about. So if George Washington is cast as this as a humble christian man um and that's and if that's the headline george washington humble christian man who happened to be uh our first president happened to be a slave owner happened to be uh, uh i guess a, a colonist in in the americas um if that's if that's the tagline if that's the headline then we start to understand George Washington. That's that's kind of his thing. That's this is who he was. The other things are just happenstance. On the other hand, if we read a history book in which we understand George Washington uh, as a slave owner who just happened to be a, a humble Christian man, who just happened to be our first president, who just happened to be uh, a, a member of the of the American colonies then we will begin to understand that as his main thing. Oh, well, Washington was all about being a slave owner. Yeah. So um, this this can be a problem, right? With I mean, there's problems with each of these views, and we can get more into that if, you, if you'd like, Jonathan. But um, when we only read about a, a, a figure from a certain angle, we will begin to only understand that person from that angle. Um, the problem with the this, other... of course, <laughs> I mean, the problem is that people are complex creatures. And so George Washington was all of those things. Just to continue with this example, he was all of those things, right? Um, uh -huh. We have to understand him. When we read these historical texts, we... we take them as they come and we we treat those historical texts uh fairly whether that's a biography or whether that's a larger history book that discusses George Washington we have to treat them fairly and incorporate them into our understanding of of this particular figure but we must also remember that it's not the whole picture um that he was a real human being who was a complex human being he wasn't just a portrait on a wall. You were going to say something. Go ahead. Another problem that results from this, and you're, you're beginning to pick up with it. Um, with this particular portraiture, there can be a tendency to be purely descriptive. And I know we all want just the facts. Mm -hmm. Just uh, the facts, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> but if history is shaped by the context of the history of the, of the people telling it, then there isn't necessarily objective grounding in your history. Right. So, so my telling of it, my telling of George Washington is perfectly legitimate as a, a white Christian man. Sure. But the Indian perspective, the Native American perspective mm -hmm. of George Washington as a, a conquering adversary that is completely equally a valid perspective. Mm-hmm. Right, because we're treating we're treating that text or that portrait as we receive it from those who produced it, which 
with the remaining schools that we're going to speak of, and the cyclical school as well, we want history to be more than just interesting stories. Um, right. Right. Or just a description. We want this to somehow impact ethics. Yeah. Yeah, if we just if, wanted stories, we wouldn't need to study history. If we just wanted stories, we could sit around a campfire and make them up. And this is somewhat strawmanning their position. Of course. But not much. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, mean, and we encourage anyone listening, of course, to dig deeper in uh, to whatever level of interest you have. Um, uh, we're designing our podcast to be more conversational and introductory to uh, to make it interesting, to, to help draw you in, to, to help you find something that you're interested in investigating further. Uh, so you're, you're totally right, Jonathan, about uh, us putting up a straw man uh, somewhat about each of these views, but um, it helps to illustrate the, the weak sides of um, the weaknesses of the position. Right. Exactly. And for a, an exemplar, uh, Ernest Trelsch, um, E R N S T T R O E L T S C H. Mm hmm. Uh, he's a German historian of religion, uh, and he would be broadly part of the historicist school. Very good. Are you ready for the next one? I am. All right, let's do uh, it. The next movement is Hegelian um, or progressive history. Um, Which is very popular right now. There are, there are different subgroups within this sure um so there's the wig school um or classic classical hegelianism but the idea is that there is some sort of moral end to history mm -hmm. and we are marching progressively on toward this great moral end of history right uh, Whereas In, historicism doesn't require that at all. Um, you can just, you can do historicism style history without what you're describing just now with this, the progressive umbrella school of thought. And the cyclical view of history as well right. Um, right. doesn't True. need a telos. Um, right. The telos, telos is the starting point. Uh the it doesn't need an end. Telos right. is end, and it's cyclical. <laughs> there is no end. <laughs> yeah. Right. Telos is the the Greek word for end. Um, it's a, a very common word uh, when you're discussing the the reason you do history. Uh, it's a very common word historians will use. And I've been spending way too much time working on my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amen. <laughs> but getting back to pop culture, um, when uh, President Obama says we're on the right side of history, mm -hmm. that is sort of this ideas of progress understanding of history. Right. Exactly. Whether you, whether you agree with s someone's view of whatever that final moral objective is is mm -hmm. that's what that discussion is about right exactly there's i mean there are there are um millions of uh christians who have a progressive view of history regarding um the salvation of the world of all the peoples of the world by the the end times so there you know there are those who believe that Everyone on the earth will be saved uh, eventually, and once every soul on the face of the planet is a believer, then bang, that's the end of time, and we 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 kick off uh, the new creation. And we'd call that a post-millennialist perspective, and we may come back to that um, in right. some of our other discussions. Yeah.
Um, I like this view of history in part because I want to be a positive person. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of my favorite church historians, uh, you may not have, you probably have heard of him is a a historian by the name of Philip Schaff. Uh, He was a part of the Mercersburg School of Theology, um, ended up uh, teaching at some of the uh, at Union and a few other important uh, seminaries. Uh, he wrote this massive history of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he edited the Select Library of Nicene and Post Nicene Fathers set. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you've ever tried to do study in early Christian history, you've probably read a project he's had his hands in. That's right. Yeah, he's uh, he's a very significant figure in uh, recent Christian historiography, for sure. Um, it's a very interesting idea, the, 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 this school of thought, that there is an end to which we are headed, uh, this end is a good thing, <laughs> and um, and we we must strive towards it as we uh, as we use this view of history in our ethics. So, as you mentioned, we use history not just for cool stories, but for application to lived ethics. So, if you have a an idea of progress view of history, a progressive view of history, um, you would you would apply that to how you vote in the voting booth, whether you think this person or that person or uh, this bill or that bill that you or ballot measure whatever that you vote on, is it is it headed the direction I think our country should head? If that matters to you, if you think that. Uh, there is a an end towards which we are trying to achieve a a good country or a a good world or a good um you know the the good end of all of history eventually under the reign of King Jesus or uh, even an unbeliever's perspective that we want our world to be the best the closest it can come to some form of utopia before the heat death of the universe uh, you still apply this view of history in your lived ethics your actual ethics as you make choices to try to impact the world around you exactly the idea is you don't want to be on the wrong side of history you want to be part of the angle of the arc of the universe toward justice that's right don't get in the way or or um make society take any steps backwards you need to help us move forward that's that's this worldview that's the the worldview represented by this umbrella that covers a few different sub schools as you mentioned Uh, before hang on just real quick uh so that's philip schaff schaff is s c h a f f uh it's possible that many of our listeners already know him but in case you don't, that's how you spell his name and how you can find his stuff. If you want to pick up something by Schaff, um, my favorite book by him, and it really does show his thought on in this view, is um, The Principle of Protestantism. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he believes that uh, the arc of religious history um, has been that there was this correct movement of the church. It was corrupted one direction by the, by Catholicism. Uh, Protestantism came out, remedied the, um, the errors of the Catholic church. Uh, There was becoming excessive individualism during his day. Uh, Every man became the Pope. And 
there was going to emerge this new third thing that would unite all Christendom um, into an effective world global Catholic church once again, hmm. uh, just not Roman Catholic. <laughs> little C. Little C. Uh, <laughs> it seems slightly naive on this side of uh, some of the controversies that have come around since uh, since his writing of this book, but yeah. maybe he was an optimist. He was an optimist, and I, I have to say, there's, there's a lot of me that really wants us to be able to stand and hold hands with all other Christians and sing Kumbaya around the throne of Jesus. Uh, I just, I don't think we're there yet, at least. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Jonathan, uh, we've got one more to discuss for this episode. Uh, why don't you tell us about that one? This last school is, again, a, could be described as a Hegelian system, mm -hmm. a progressive system, but it is... It's more distinct, right? It's more distinct. Um, it Of all of these, this is the one that is the most concrete as a worldview. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I keep dancing around it without actually calling its name. Um, <laughs> you won't conjure it if you say it out loud. I just want you to know. Uh, the specter <laughs> of this historical school. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, the fourth school uh, we're talking about today is the Marxist school of historiography. Uh, I've just dropped several awful Marxist jokes there. I apologize. <laughs> Um, it's fine. He's dead. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Jonathan, we've all heard about Marxism, of course, uh, developing into a political system. What what does Marxism have to do with historiography? Marxist historiography underpins Marxist political philosophy. In so if, if Marx... Marxist historiography doesn't work, then the philosophy won't work. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have, if you take Marxist uh, political philosophy, you have to take this historiographic perspective, at least in part. Sure. Um, you at least have to have a functional Marxist perspective in your historiography. Yeah. Um, so Marxist historiography, uh, like Hegelianism, uh, believes that there are there's a thesis and an antithesis, and we're aiming uh, two sides, uh, one idea and another, like mm -hmm. the Catholics and the Protestants, moving toward this third new thing. Uh, and we have the the at the beginning of history man was in a state of nature he was he was free and unoppressed and he was equal uh we started gathering together uh to to be able to have resources um and for mutual protection and we put the big guy in charge because he was the guy who could protect our our property. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, the the big guy protecting our property uh, saw that he could amass more stuff um, because he could ask for it. Yeah. Um, and eventually, you have a divide between the wealthy and the the poor the worker mm -hmm. and you have the wealthy being supported by the middle class who has aspirations of being wealthy and so they more or less step on the poor mm -hmm. to help build this this thing eventually the workers will 
realize they now have more power than the big strong man. They will overthrow the um, the oppressive governance system mm -hmm. um, through revolution and institute um, back to state of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be equal and free. Uh, and he says this because the history of man has to be observed in observable, tangible uh, processes. So the idea of progress is a, in our previous, the previous system we discussed, mm -hmm. is a Platonistic system. There is this idea of a good that we are conforming to. Yeah. Marxism says everything that is Marxist Marxism is a realist philosophy in that everything that we taste sense touch smell that's real mm -hmm. and there's not some great beyond realm of the forms um or mind of god that right. we're aspiring to so this system uh similar to um, Hegel uh, and and some others is what philosophy would call a materialist worldview. Um, just as a philosophical side note, uh, a materialist worldview does not consider anything that we claim is supernatural to actually have any supernatural origin or property but that it can all be ex explained with some material, some observable uh, scientific process. So a materialist worldview, a Marxist worldview, is completely opposed to a supernatural worldview. So any worldview that allows for um, even the possibility of something supernatural existing and uh interacting with uh that of the material plane i guess is one way to put it there are methodol methodological materialists right so right. they would say uh, there may or may not be a god but we can't know him in history right or and like a geologist has to be a, a functional materialist because a geologist studies rocks like yeah that's it the geologist studies rocks and that's it the geologist doesn't study uh anything else <laughs> about it his job is to is to understand uh what uh how these rocks are composed and what's going on with them and whatever um it's the question of supernatural forces is irrelevant a supernaturalist can be a functional uh, materialist, uh, whether that's for a moment, for a hobby, or for a career, um, yeah. That's, so that's that's absolutely right. That's a good point. But that's the philosophical side, um, not so much necessarily the historical side. But I think I think that our listeners can see uh, a theme with what you're talking about, Jonathan. All these different schools of thought that as you understand history is how you will apply that history to your ethical thinking and behavior. And so as Christians, we have a distinct Christian ethic. Um, and so we believe that there is a distinct Christian historiography. Yeah. Uh, not that we can't listen to and learn from these historians uh, mm -hmm. who are part of these other schools. And I'm not saying that people who participate in these other schools aren't Christians. Right. But I do think there is a particular way you can apply your theological perspective to make a coherent history with your ethic. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's it's it may be um, not a formalized process, it or it, like some official thought process. Maybe you have ever made, uh, listener, that, that to make that choice. So this is how I understand history. Therefore, this. It may just be that um, something that has come along with how you're thinking. You think along these lines, and so you act ethically along those same lines. Um, we may have described in the process of this uh, episode a school of thought that you subscribe to and maybe you didn't even know. Um, but regardless, this is basically kind of how the schools of thought break down, except for those that we're going to discuss next time. Yes. So in two weeks on November 18th, we will discuss our understanding of Christian historiography. That's right. So that will have a couple of schools of thought. It will have um, its own uh, idiosyncrasies, just like the four that we discussed today did. Uh, I'm looking forward to that one. I think that'll be a good one. All right, if you've stuck around this far, you're now ready to hear our special announcement. Uh, this is only our second volume of An Oral History of the Church, but uh, we've enjoyed it so much and we're so inspired by what we've been doing that we are launching a new companion podcast called Saints Gone Before. The podcast Saints Gone Before begins on Monday, December 5th. So um, from Jonathan and I, you will start receiving, if you subscribe, Saints Gone Before every Monday and uh, a new episode of an oral history of the church every two Fridays. Um, this podcast will be like bursts of short audiobooks. This new podcast will purely feature primary sources uh, in the public domain, <laughs> read aloud <laughs> by an oral history of the church co-hosts, uh, Jonathan and myself. These episodes will be short, uh, something that you can listen to during a commute, you know, a reasonably short period of time. We're not going to yeah. read for two hours and hope you endure and hope our voice endures for, for all of that. That's right. So um, like longer texts will break up into multiple episodes. And we do hope to to go through some of what we consider to be some of the more important pieces of um, primary source material of Christian history. Or even just the interesting ones, if not in all, always the important ones. <laughs> oh, so I can get us to read the portion where Origen's mother uh, steals his clothing. Uh, <laughs> we should talk about this off the air, Jonathan. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll save that for another podcast. Um, each document will be described with its relevant uh, bibliographic data. Uh, so if you want to go and pick up uh, the volume and read along with us, um, or if you are listening and say, hey, I want to come back to that, um, you can go and find it in the text that we mentioned, and it should be small enough that you can find it on the page. Uh, and we will range from the early church uh, to the modern era, um, uh, or as modern as we can get without violating copyright, unless someone <laughs> wants to donate uh, their book to the cause. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yes. Hint, hint, Tim Keller. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like he would ever listen to this. Anyway, so again, that first episode arrives on December 5th. We will uh, include another announcement about that uh, in subsequent episodes of this podcast, and you can catch it on our um, Facebook or Twitter feeds um, as well. That first episode will feature the first half of an early Christian text called the Didache, uh, the, the teaching, the teacher's. Uh, this early Christian text was from church leaders 
who decided, okay, let's try to standardize our practices a little bit. Here's some instructions, some basic instructions, how to perform uh, all the practical tasks of the church. Uh, if you got a baptism you want to perform, uh, the best way to do it is like this. If you can't get this element, then the second best way is to do it like that. And if you still can't get this other element, then the third best way is to do it like this. So that's just one example of that's what that's like. And a lot of folks haven't read the Didache. It's uh, it's interesting to have uh, such an early kind of church manual. Like, hey, guys, we don't really know how to do baptisms or we don't really know what to do about like a visiting um, teacher who says that he's a Christian and wants to talk about uh, Jesus. What do we do? Uh, so we're going to start with that that book. That'll that'll be two episodes. And then uh, after that, we'll do something more uh, related to Christmas since it'll be right around that time. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything else to say about either that new companion podcast or the episode that we just uh, released today? As someone who's been in ministerial training, it feels good to know that uh, for 2,000 years, people have been scratching their heads and asking the older minister, how do I baptize again? (laughs) Uh... (laughs) I don't know a better way to sign off. So we're going to call it right here. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Uh-huh.